Well, it's a Halloween weekend. I don't believe it. I don't do it. This is not Halloween costume. <laughs> no. This is an African costume. <laughs> I'm from Nigeria, originally from Nigeria. Um, this is an African attire. <laughs> I'm so blessed to be a part of this church. International Sunday today, that's why you see so many of us you know, in this attire. Though I come to church every Sunday, <laughs> my own native <laughs> attire. Well, praise the Lord. We've been so blessed to have a wonderful pastor, Pastor Don uh, Scott Brown. <laughs> I mean, he's so thoughtful of the church to set up, set a uh, Sunday aside each year to celebrate divide, uh, people from different cultures and nationalities. Uh, today we'll also be blessed by somebody that was not born here originally, though now American citizen, uh, is going to come forward wearing just something similar like this to deliver a message to us. I've known him for close to 20 years now, back in Lagos, Nigeria. When I gave my life to Christ in 1988, I made a decision that I'm going to cut off all old friends, and I did, all my old friends. If you are not a believer, you don't go to church, you don't pray, you don't believe in God, I cut them off. So I decided to have you know, different circle of friends, believers. So I met this good friend of mine that really helped me in my early stage of my Christian life because of his belief and uh, the faith in God. It really challenged me. And uh, through him, I met the man that is going to be here today to charge us. And uh, Believe me, since I met him, there's one thing that is so unique about him. His faithfulness and dedication to God is unparalleled. He's so committed to God, and I can vouch for him anytime, anywhere. And uh, to the glory of God, he's married. They have three kids, and uh, we've lived together, we've worked together. I know him so well. And uh, I want to tell you, when he comes up here to preach, or to charge, because I listened to him in the first service, it's not more or less of charging, it's not really preaching. But if anybody has any doubts in whatever he says, you can cross check through the Bible, that's what makes us Christians. It's, what he's saying, is it in line with the word of God? If it's in line with the word of God, it makes you a better Christian. And uh, I want you to know, I want you to know that when he comes here, just like what Mary says, in the, uh, in the Bible, to in the in the wedding at the canal of Galilee, you know what he says? When the wine was gone, there was nothing. They needed help, and they went to, to Mary. Say, we we are we, we ran off of wine. What do we do? And said, we have a son. I want to tell you that was Jesus' first miracle. Nobody knew him. That was Jesus' first introduction. So, whatever he tells you, do it obedience and they did it and they had their expectation met many of us here are here this morning with different expectations many different expectations you know but God tells that uh, the Bible tells us that God has not called us to serve him in vain when you are here today when he comes up God may minister to you differently from what you are expecting but the truth of the matter is, whatever it tells you, do it. I have the privilege to bring on stage my dear brother, brother Ayo. But let me tell you one thing about his name. We know him here as brother Jeremiah or Deborah Wale. But let me tell you, we originally, we called him brother Hayo. We're so fond of calling him brother Hayo. The Hayo means joy. Joy. That's what Hayo means in our language, Yoruba language, you know, Southwest Nigeria. <laughs> Joy. And when you have a baby, you have a baby, before you give the baby a name, you look at the circumstances surrounding the birth of the baby. You know, we see so many similarities in the Bible too. So we have a culture similar to that. So when they name him Hayo, 
I know one day they knew, they, the parent knew he was going to be a Christian, bringing joy to people. And I believe that as he comes on this stage today, he's going to bring joy to you. Praise the Lord. Mibrahi, come on stage, please. <laughs> and as he comes on stage, I want to let you know, he's a teacher. He teaches mathematics at uh, Jafansi County. So, maybe some of your students are here. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, my brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think we need to stand up one more time, uh, brethren. And let's make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, if you don't know this, we have different languages in the world, so many of them. But hallelujah is said the same way. So when I say praise the Lord, I want everybody to say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's have our seat, please. Uh, before we pray, I did this in the first service. Uh, my pastor will pardon me for this. I have to repeat it. Uh, in absolute humility, I want my pastor and the wife to stand up. You will see them appearing in Indian attire. <laughs> Let's clap for them, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is a very simple practice that is sending a great message. Like I said, he's sending a message of acceptance. He's sending a message of love. And he's telling us, the entire church, that in spite of our differences, we can live together in unity. He's telling us that even though our faces are different, our languages are different, and our food and different things like that, you know, we have something greater than the language we speak. We have something greater than the food. We have something greater than all those differences. The saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is the same. And that is why you see them today. And what they have done, I'm telling you, uh, it's a great thing to us. We appreciate it, Pastor. Thank you so much. Uh, let us have some words of prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for today, O oh God, for bringing us together to celebrate our unity, even in diversity. We appreciate you for what you have done. Thank you for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that is a common ground for us, O God. And I pray that we take preeminence of all we shall do today and everything will come to glorify your name. Thank you, Father, for we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to appreciate the leadership of the church and our pastor for giving us equal opportunity to worship, to serve, and to grow, up, I mean, our faith. Because uh, in a country like this, where you have almost every country of the world represented, and in a church like this, where you have different people from different parts of the world, you know, uh, it's a great thing when you are privileged, when you have equal opportunity with every other person to grow your faith, to serve the Lord as you will have done, exactly as you will have done in your native land. So that's a wonderful thing. We appreciate that, Pastor, and we thank uh, the leadership, too, for creating such an environment. Uh, today, I will be talking on we are all one in Christ. We are all one in Christ. From Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it reads us, There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Jesus. And then I have another um, passage of the scripture like that. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So these passages of the scriptures, they are telling us about the oneness of the body of Christ. The centrality of the gospel message is love. The Bible enjoins us to live together in love. And these passages of the scriptures, they are telling us that uh, as we are different, you can see our fingers are different from the legs, different from the eyes, and all these come together as one body. 
So the same way our faces may be different, our languages may be different, our cultures may be different, but then we have a common ground, and that is the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is telling us, no matter where I come from, I'm in Nigeria by birth, uh, no matter where you come from, you are in Indian, you are from the Middle East, wherever you come from, as long as you are a believer, as long as you are a Christian, we are together. We are one in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is one of the reasons we are here today, to celebrate our unity in diversity, telling us that our differences do not matter. Our languages, different languages do not matter. But what matters to us is the fact that we are all saved by the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, I should be free, you know, to relate with anybody here, being Christians, because of that blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I was leaving my country, Nigeria, uh, to the United States, my church family called us to the altar like this, and they prayed for my family. And I still remember one of the prayer points was, uh, you know, the kind of concern. You are leaving your Christian family here, going to a strange land you have never been to. And honestly, I didn't know anybody here then. The only person that was here that I was thinking I would meet is this my brother that just introduced me. He was here three months earlier. So that was the only person I, I could look like, you know, getting here. So my church family was concerned. You are going. How is it going to be? But by the grace of God, coming here and meeting another church family, a more diverse family, to me, it only amounts to a change of environment. And that is to tell you, Christ is the same anywhere, everywhere. So, therefore, as we are gathering together today, we call it International Sunday. We are celebrating our, you know, I mean, celebrating unity in diversity. Uh, after this, we'll congregate in the gym there to share food and, you know, relate together. But brethren, our Lord Jesus Christ is calling us unto love. He's telling us that we should love everybody, especially, you know, people from the household of faith. And it goes beyond that. Therefore, as we are celebrating here, we are saying, you know, we are celebrating oneness. Let's live the life, even beyond the church. Let's tell the world that we can, in spite of our differences, live together in peace. What we see outside there is segregation. What we see outside there is discrimination. But the church will be able to stand out and live the life and tell the world that segregation is a sin and discrimination is evil. Let's live the life, brethren. Let's tell them. It's not only by the words of mouth, but even by the way we live. So, uh, as it is, brethren, in our places of work, we should be able to demonstrate it. In our, I mean, in our neighborhood, let's demonstrate it, that Jesus Christ is one. And uh, apart from that, I also want us to look at the other side of the coin. When we are talking of one body of Christ, we are privileged to be in a, in a free country like this in the United States, and that is why we are able to gather together like this, sitting down and enjoying, you know, uh, songs, messages, and other things like that. Do you know we have other members of the same body of Christ who are not privileged to sit down like this? Those people who cannot even stand up and say, yes, I'm a Christian. If they do that, they're in trouble. Do you know there are some people who cannot carry their Bible like this? If they do, they have to wrap it in the paper. Do you know there are some people who have no permanent place of worship? They have to hide in different caves and other things like that to worship God. We see this on social media. Anytime you see it, do you have any concern? We watch it over the TV sometimes. We hear of massacre of Christians all over the world. Does this, I mean, mean anything to you? Brethren, what's our concern? For our fellow Christians. I mean those preachers. I mean the missionaries in countries where preaching Christ is illegal. I mean in countries where carrying the Bible is a crime. We have the name of Christ being preached all over the world. People are getting converted. But the legal environment there in these countries is not conducive for these our Christian brothers and sisters. So what is our concern for them? How do we take it anytime we see this? Some people will ask, what are we going to do? The answer is very simple. I want us to watch these videos to buttress what I'm, what I'm talking about. To see some countries where Christianity is, I mean, 
uh, where it's, it's very, very difficult to live as a Christian. Let's watch this video. Christian persecution is increasing. The scale and dynamics of Christian persecution has changed and grown drastically. Millions of Christians are persecuted for their faith worldwide, in more countries and in more ways than ever before. How can you measure this increase in persecution? For over 20 years, Open Doors has been producing the World Watch List, which ranks the countries where it is most difficult to be a Christian. This well-researched report is compiled by a group of regional experts, audited by an outside organization specializing in religious freedom, and it is credited as the best and most authoritative report of its kind. Through on-the-ground interviews and data analysis, the list provides an accurate picture of the difficulties persecuted Christians experience around the world. The list looks at and measures the types of persecution believers experience from the government, the community, and even their own families. But the list is not just numbers and figures. It represents those who have decided to follow Jesus, no matter what the cost may be. We've seen an unprecedented rise in persecution, especially in the Middle East, Central Asia, and Africa. Based on the raw data and recent global events, it will likely get worse. In 2016, Iraq has moved to number two on the list. Iraq has seen tens of thousands of Christians forced to flee their homes because of the terror of ISIS. Many have been displaced for over a year now, burdened with the struggle of daily living as they face an uncertain future. Eritrea, ranked number three, has had one of the most dramatic jumps in rank. Christians suffer intense persecution in all spheres of life. Believers face violence and imprisonment in horrific conditions, some being locked inside metal shipping containers. Uzbekistan, ranked at number 15, has one of the harshest dictatorships in Central Asia. Because of the constant pressure and surveillance, it is almost impossible for Christians to display or share their faith. We believe there is only one body of Christ, and when one part suffers, every part suffers. We hope you feel called to learn more and pray for the millions of believers around the world where persecution is a daily reality. Praise the Lord. We can see that. Some Christians are not really finding it easy to profess their faith. Just, I mean, uh, unlike those of us here. But the fact that we are not facing that problem does not mean that we should leave them to their problem. Because we belong to the same body of Christ, we should be concerned. So let's look at this also. But if Jesus could do that in my life, today he has a plan for your life. And he took me to amazing nations. One among them was North Korea. Last year, I was invited by the government of North Korea to come and perform for the 100th birth anniversary of their founder, Kim Il-sung. 834 performers were chosen from all over the world, and I was the only Indian chosen from my country. And it was a great opportunity to play, but more so an opportunity to share the gospel. Yes, if you share the gospel, you don't need to be a prophet to understand that you will be killed. But I understood in the word of God that if anyone tries to save their life, we'll lose it. If anyone loses their life for the sake of Christ, we'll find it. So I inform my parents, there's a big possibility that I might be killed in North Korea. So if you don't hear from me on the 17th of April, that's a mutual understanding that either I'm killed or in prison and I will see you in heaven because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So I went to North Korea so excited to live and to die for Jesus. Two spies followed me every single day of my life, every single minute, in fact. When you have two ungodly spies following you all the time, what do you do? You share the gospel. Because they're always with you. They will never leave you. They might forsake you, but they will never leave you. And since they're always with you, what a great opportunity to talk about Jesus. You don't need to go to North Korea to talk about Jesus. Jesus is putting a nation in your heart. Be obedient to him. Say yes to him. And I got into trouble. Sure, next day the, my interpreter went and informed to the official that Benny is doing this because I used her to translate my testimony to the spies. Now I'm in big trouble. It's sure I'll be killed. But the right perspective is what a great opportunity to stand in front of the official. And I shared my testimony knowing that I might be killed. 
But the official asked me a question. How could you be so sure you heard the voice of Jesus at 16? It could have been your own imagination. I told him, sir, my own imagination told me to kill myself. It is the voice of Jesus that gave me life and life in abundance. And he heard my testimony. And I want to tell you, my friends, be courageous, even to the point of death, to share the love of Jesus Christ. Don't ever fear your life because Jesus is in charge. I was not killed in North Korea because it was not my time to die. He knows my time, actually. And Praise the Lord. You can see this is the kind of life some Christians live in some countries. A life between life and death. You have to choose which one. But by the grace of God, they still remain Christians. But I'm calling us this morning. Do we have any concern for Christians like this? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And in Hebrews 13, verse 3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Remember the prisoners as if you are chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourself are in the body also. Because you belong to the same body of Christ and they are facing this kind of situation. What is our concern? People see it all the time especially when there's a kind of massacre of Christians in a particular country, and they ask, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Brothers and sisters, the answer is clear and simple. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse, I mean, chapter 10, verse 4 to 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The answer here is fight. But the kind of fight is not the physical one. You are not called upon to carry guns and begin to kill people. But you are called upon to go on your knee and pray. If we doubt the power of prayer, it means we don't believe the... I mean, if we doubt the efficacy of prayer, it means we don't believe the power of God. Brethren, prayer is more effective than all these phys uh, physical fights you think. So, we cannot leave these people there. Let us stand in the gap and pray unto God. One thing I've discovered in the, I mean, I discovered in the life of uh, the Israelites is that anytime they had problem, you will see that they will begin to groan, they will begin to murmur, and they will begin to do all those things. But there will be no solution to their problem until they cry unto God. God will then intervene. Brethren, it is time for us to pray. It is time for us to pray because we, we, we have that name, Jesus Christ, to whom every name must bow. When we call that name, who is the leader in that country? Which kind of government? Everything has to bow to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we look at Ephesians chapter 1, 19 to 21, it reads us, The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rules and authority, all rules, all government, even North Korea, if we pray in unity, Christians, God is going to do something. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, Jesus Christ is penetrating, but there are some legal environments in some countries that is not really allowing the, the spread of the gospel. We cannot fold our hands and think since we are not, you know, affected by all those problems, then we don't have to do something. We all belong to the same body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, let's stand in the gap for these people. Let us pray unto our God. He will listen to our cry and he will solve the problem. He will destroy every stronghold to the penetration of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in any country that we are having it. Let us stand in the gap for these Christians who are not finding it easy. Brethren, even though we are here, by the grace of God, we enjoy all the freedom. Let's give all praises to God who has given us this freedom. It's a gift. It's a gift. Really, it's a gift. But then we should remember these people because we belong to the same body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand in the gap for them. Let's pray unto our God and let's see what our God will do. But I tell you, anytime we are praying and we are fighting this battle, we are fighting a battle that is won already. All we need to do is to activate it. Because I know that Christ told Peter, you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. 
There's no government that can stand against our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nobody that can stand against this, the spread of the gospel. Therefore, brethren, all we need to do is to stand up. You will see that even though God, I mean, God has promised Abraham uh, deliverance, he promised his descendants a kind of deliverance. But anytime the Israelites had problem, they needed to pray unto God to activate it. So the same thing we need to do. Let's rise up. Let's stand up in prayers. Our church is doing a lot in helping the missionaries in different countries of the world. Yes, that is great. Let's contribute. Let's do different things we can do. But in addition to this, we need to stand up and pray. Brethren, prayer is key to what I'm talking about. Prayer is key to all this, the sufferings of, of, of Christians over the, all over the world. We should not say because we are not in those countries, then we fold our hands. Let's join these brethren. Let's pray unto God for the deliverance of his people. Let's pray unto God for the spread of the gospel. As these people are getting converted, let us pray for enabling environments for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to thrive. I just spoke with somebody like a few minutes ago, less than, I mean, less, less than 30 minutes ago. He was telling me about how it is in India. We have people getting converted. But the problem is the environment is not really conducive. Brethren, just picture it in a way that you are one of those people. What will you do? But now that you are not one of them, there's still something you will do. Remember, we are all one in Christ. Let's rise up and do something. Uh, this is a challenge to us this morning. I still want us to stand up, brethren, and pray unto God on behalf of these people. Can we rise up, please? Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Let it begin from here. Let's raise our voices unto God. Let's remember these people, our fellow Christians in other countries. Let's open our mouth and pray. Let's open our mouth and pray. Brethren, pray unto God that the Lord Almighty will strengthen the faith of these fellow believers in other countries where it's not easy for them to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Those people are running from pillar to pole all because they are Christians. Those who are not so free, like just like, I mean, they are not as free as you are. They cannot even carry their Bible. It's a problem. If they carry the Bible, they are, they are doomed. If they tell anybody they are Christians, they are dead. Let's identify with them. Let's pray with them. You can see the second video we saw. All because he shared his testimony, he was almost killed, if not for the intervention of God. Who knows? Maybe somebody prayed for him before he left. He will have been killed. Brethren, in your closet, please don't forget to do this all the time. Pray unto God that the Lord Almighty will intervene. Father, Lord God in heaven, we appreciate you. We thank you because you are God. We give you all the glory. We thank you. We honor your name. We bless you, Father, Lord God in heaven, for all that you have done. Father, King of glory, let him be glorified. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Our Lord and our Father, we appreciate you, God, for a day like this, O oh God, that we are celebrating our unity in diversity, that despite our differences, the blood of Jesus Christ is stronger than different languages. The blood of Jesus Christ is stronger than different cultures. Father, we thank you and we worship you. And we are equally remembering our people, the same body of Christ in other countries, where the, 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 the environment is not conducive for them, oh God. Those people are living in hostility. I mean, the, the missionaries and pastors that are, that are in countries where Christians are persecuted. I mean, those Christians who have to run from pillar to pole just because they are Christians. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that every stronghold impeding the spread of the gospel in those countries, oh God, be pulled down in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I pray for individual one of us here, oh God, that as we are celebrating to, together today, that we are one in Christ. Oh Lord, give us the grace to go into the outside world and demonstrate it the same way. That we can live without segregation. That we can live without discrimination. That we can live together as one. My Lord and my Father, it takes your grace, O oh Lord. I pray that you multiply this grace upon us, Father. Thank you, God Almighty, because you have answered. For we have prayed in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. What an incredible challenge to us. In a few moments, uh, I'm going to give you instructions as you leave here, but before I do, I want to give you instructions that go beyond the meal. 
And that is, as say he challenged us, to take the words that are proclaimed today by Jeremiah and to put them into practice in our life. The church is different than the world. And it ought to be very obvious we're different. It says, by our love for one another, our concern for the well-being of others. And so there's two ways that we've been challenged to practice that this morning. And one is praying for those around the world that are suffering just because they call upon the name of Jesus Christ. We need to be more diligent in praying for the persecuted believers of Jesus Christ. We need to do that. And in our busyness of life, it's wrong of us to forget that others are giving their life, losing their families, seeing horrendous things because they dare call on the name of Jesus. We're blessed in this country. We really don't know what persecution is. But we're like the Israelites. We're good at whining and grumbling and complaining. Please, let the Holy Spirit develop in you a greater passion and compassion for the suffering believers around the world and that the gospel will go forward with strength. Number two is with the brothers and sisters we have in this church. We are a diverse church. We love that because the kingdom of God is diverse. Every nation, every tongue, every language, every tribe, everywhere. The gospel is powerful, and we have a unity. You can pluck you out of here and put you in a culture you've never been in, but stick you with brothers and sisters in Christ who profess Jesus Christ, and even when you don't speak the same language, you feel a connection and kindredship that you can't gain in any other way. Why? Because the Spirit of God cries forth to God, and we connect through that. But we also need to take the energy and effort to recognize we need to connect more with one another. We need to open up our hearts and open up our lives. And I want to challenge you when you leave here to do, do just that. Will you open up your life to somebody you don't know in the body of believers? Maybe who talks a different language than you do, or maybe has a different family structure than you do, or maybe has a different cultural background than you. Can you? Will you open up your homes and open up your hearts and just say, hey, here's who I am. Here's what Jesus Christ has done. That's the common bond. And let's connect with one another.